morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Ray Dolan live from Mullingar in Mullingar, and we're at St. Mary's Hospital. And actually, when you go looking for any reference to St. Mary's Hospital, it's actually disappeared. Um, but there it is, and 1841 is written on it. But I'm lucky enough to be here with uh, Mullingar's historian, Ruth Illingworth, who's going to give me some information on St. Mary's. And uh, as I say, hold on, folks, because the information will be coming fairly. <laughs> Fairly, fairly sharp here with Ruth. So there you are. We're going to introduce Ruth. Hello, Ruth. How Hello, are you? Hello. Good morning, Ray. Ruth, once again, it's great to have you on from Mullingar in Mullingar, giving us a bit of history about the Mullingar St Mary's Hospital. Is this the original hospital? This is the original building behind us here. Mm. Uh, it was originally, of course, Mullingar Union Workhouse. All right. And it still has the date, 1841, when it opened. Let's see it there somewhere. It's just over the door, and right above. The door there, the upper floor dormer windows, that was the boardroom where the poor law guardians met. And the poor law guardians were the elected officials who were responsible for running the workhouse and what was known as the poor law union, a district which was stretched uh, 12 miles in all directions from here. Uh, that picture that you showed us there starting off, that would have been back in 18... There are a couple of photographs here which were taken 18. in 1916. Right, 19. When the workhouse was still in existence. Yeah. Um, it there by then had a full hospital wing and these are the staff. Let me just bring you back um, to that because they're very interesting looking people as well. They are this, indeed. Um, your man with the white coat is uh, fairly... He's quite... Do, he looks like the boss. <laughs> He was the, the, the doctor, Dr. Dylan Kelly, a very prominent man in the town. He also worked in the county infirmary. Uh, he's actually mentioned, not by name, but he's described in one of James Joyce's uh, novels, Stephen Hero. Yeah. Uh, and the lady there, the nun standing behind the man, who the man, he, that's the workhouse master, S uh, Sister Veronica O'Growney. She was the sister of the very famous Gaelic scholar father Eugene O'Growney, uh, after whom O'Growney Terrace Drive in Malangar mm. is named. Um, and these were nuns of the Mercy Order. They were brought to Malangar in 1898 by Bishop Thomas Nulty to look after the hospital wing and they later looked after the county hospital as well, up until the 1970s, in fact. So that's a very interesting couple of pictures. Dr. Keelan, a uh, prominent doctor in the town. His family had a, a drapery store in the main street, but uh, he worked as a doctor up until the 1950s. Uh, were they the nuns that came? Oh, they're, not, uh, they're not nuns, they're... they're um these would be their well they're nursing sisters yeah right they, yeah they would, they would have come on the canal would they uh no these ones came by uh carriage from yeah. tullamore and when they arrived at the outskirts of Mullingar, a priest on horseback met them and escorted them to here very so very good the, their arrival. so come here we'll just do a little bit of walking here because mm. this building here as i say this is the um the original building and it's a magnificent yes. building and it'd be magnificent if we got it going sorry if we got it going and we got hit by a car there. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it was built, the architect was a man called Charles Wilkinson. Right. And he designed workhouses all over Ireland. And, uh, this was one of 131 workhouses in Ireland. And of course they were in Britain as well because people like Charles Dickens and later Charlie Chapman spent parts of their childhood uh, in workhouses or members of their family. And what date are we going back to now, you could say, when this, this building, I know it's 1841. It, it opened in 1841 yeah. and it was built following what was known as the Poor Law Act, which was an act for the setting up of workhouses right. in Ireland. So this is one of, there were two in Westmead, the one here, and there was one in Athlone, there was one later on in Delvin, uh, which was built in the 1850s. But, uh, and how do you qualify to get into the workhouse? You have to be pretty much destitute. Destitute, yeah. uh, no one to look after you. Um, and when it opened, there were probably fewer than 100, 150 people in it in its first year. There right. were no what were they were described as paupers. That was the term that was used for them. Oh they were desperately destitute and poor. Um, and then the Great Famine started. The famine began in 1845, and 1846, 1847. The numbers coming in here increased dramatically. 
Um, but I mean, we're looking at like we're standing in a field now, and I mean, this is only the front area. Was there yeah. a build? Was there buildings here where we're yeah, standing? All these buildings. That's part of the original building as well. And was this here as well? This, uh, this would have been, although I don't think there was grass on it then. Okay, it was so just we're bare going. Stone. But so this, this you could is, say this is the reception area. That's exactly what it was. You came in through those doors there, yeah. and then you were sent to wings one on either side here. Right. Uh, they segregated men and women. So if a family came in here, the father uh, and his sons, if they were over sort of nine or 10 years mm -hmm. of age, they would go into one wing. Right. And the mother and the girls and the very young children, if they were boys, would go into the other wing. Uh, and in those wings, there were dormitories, the sort of mass dormitories where they slept. Yeah. And during the height of the famine, so many people in here that they had three people to a bed. And really, people yeah. And sort of kind of put in extra beds. There were at the height of the famine in 1847, which was a dreadful winter, one of the worst winters ever recorded in Ireland. There was snow lying meters deep everywhere, and there were upwards of a thousand people there trying to get in here. There were so many people trying to get into the workhouse that they no longer had enough space for them. And what they did was they took over a whole lot of buildings, old farmhouses, uh, around the town, in the town, yeah. and used them as what were known as auxiliary workhouses. Uh, and one of them actually was, as a to your family, do, do where the bar is, yeah. that well, there was an old warehouse there. It, it had been a brewery uh, and it had closed down. And into that brewery, they packed upwards of a thousand children oh uh, in the midst of the rusting machinery. Uh, uh, carrying on then into the later years, this then became the old folks home, would you say? It did. I mean, it was a workhouse. It, it <coughs> remained a workhouse. That's its official description up mm -hmm. until the 1920s. Uh, and after the Great Famine, the numbers here would have dropped off. Uh, many of the people who were in here, again, the very, very poor. People were completely destitute. People, in some cases, had been evicted from their holdings or had no land at all. Right. Uh, and also, often quite the, the very old. There was, there was no old age pension until 1909. Uh, and there was huge poverty in this country. So they went in here mm -hmm. um, and they were looked after. It was a rather strict regime. I think they had to eat their meals in silence photographs if you look at websites on the history of workhouses yeah. there's some extraordinary photographs from workhouses in Britain and you see, you see lines of old men and women sitting on these long kind of forms um, and they're they're kind of they're wearing a kind of a uniform this almost looks like a bit like a school uniform or a prison yeah. uniform um, but they were they were fed and they were cared for uh, and it's became known then after 1921 the new Irish government abolished workhouses uh, right. and they replaced them the title now became the county home and that's what it became known as then the county home although to many people there was still a sort of a stigma about this it was still seen yeah. as it was the workhouse and you didn't really want to end up here if you could avoid it I remember as a kid um, in St Mary's that we were encouraged to actually go and see the old folks in mm -hmm. in, in this place, in this building yes and uh, there's a great character of the building I remember meeting a man there and uh, he was a, he was American Irish and yeah. uh, he actually had lost his, his legs and um, whatever he just ended back and in a way it was a bit like the workhouse yeah he had come home and this is where he was going to spend his last days yes uh, and and uh -huh. that's where he spent them but um, I just always that was my story but another another thing as well is that there was a big building here that was um, collected and brought to Europe that's right I mean at the part of the complex mm. here which mm. stretches back quite quite a distance mm. uh, uh, and of course up until very recently when they opened the new buildings when they still had patients my uncle Paddy spent his last years here in one of the uh, room of a ward upstairs along one of those blocks um, but the the hospital wing which opened in the 1890s and was run by the Mercy sisters uh, by, and they also had a convent there St Bridget's convent 
Uh, and by the 1990s, part of that building, that hospital wing, was completely dilapidated and crumbling away. And some of the stone from it was taken to Belgium mm. uh, and used to build the Round Tower, uh, which is uh, at the Irish Peace Park at Mazine uh, in Belgium. It was uh, at the scene of a major First World War battle where Irish soldiers from north and south, Unionists and Nationals, fought side by side. Uh, and it's the the round tower of course is kind of a symbol of ireland so it's the the stone from the round tower came from the workhouse buildings here from Brilliant. the old hospital we'll just keep walking a bit as well because um there's still still a lot there's still and a lot of building back there as well you know yeah i mean it was a huge complex and we have um I mean, the, 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 as I said, it was run, the, the Poor Law Union and the Guardians met. They, they met, I think, every Tuesday in the boardroom and there would be contracts given out for providing food, providing fuel. Uh, I think the imported coal from Whitehaven in northwest England. Um, but wow. local business people would have contracts to supply food to here. Um, it would have given a fair amount of employment um, to, to people and um, the, but, but the, the people who were in here, I said there were men, there were women and children yeah. and during the famine years and afterwards the children, men or teenagers, they would be taught various trades. Uh, for example, a lot of the boys would have been trained up um, carpentry, uh, masonry, uh, weaving, uh, the girls cooking and sewing and things like that. There was a description in 1848, a local newspaper editor, Richard Perdue, who mm -hmm. was obsessed with his idea that all these unfortunates in here, that they were costing the ratepayers money and he wanted to be sure that they weren't idle yeah. uh, and he reported about these elderly women in one corner who were industriously knitting as he described them. So the poor women were there knitting away but uh, the, the workhouse editor would have had a school, all the workhouses did. In yeah. fact, um, Charlie Chaplin said that he, the education he got in the workhouse school he attended as a boy in London was possibly better than some other children would have had in schools outside the workhouse. Mm. Uh, and again, in the, there are accounts of, of teenagers in the 1850s and 60s being given new suits of clothes that were now leaving the workhouse and mostly they were emigrating. In fact, in 1853, they sent 100 teenage girls from this workhouse to Canada. Uh, and they were brought, they had new clothes and everything, and they were brought by carriage to the railway station. And a special train from Galway came up and brought them to Dublin for the first stage of a journey that ended in Quebec. Wow. Uh, so that, that was in the I'd 1850s. I say a lot of people left <coughs> Westmead. Uh, we were just chatting to a guy yesterday, and um, uh, friends of, that we know actually are living in um, South America. Yes. And they're out there as well. Oh yeah, I mean a lot of the people who came into this workhouse, particularly the younger ones, they would have emigrated sometimes with the poor law guardians and others paying their passage to America or Canada or wherever it was they were going. In the background there, there's a new building, so that would be the new um, the nursing home, is it? Or yes, I, think there, I mean, there were all these <coughs> buildings, I mean, you can still see the, the original buildings there, yeah. but there were also the big buildings were added on at various times in the early 20th century, I think, uh, uh, and the conditions improved over the decades. Although I'm going to say a lot to a few people here as well. Uh, Alistair is coming down here next week, and he says, uh, don't forget, oh yeah, <coughs> don't get knocked down. <laughs> I'm <laughs> glad Philip is out there coming in here. So it's great history. Thanks, Philip. Uh, morning from Scotland. Um, be God, I better get over there. Get over there. Oh, you know, yeah. Uh, morning from Scotland. Very informative. That's D and Jerry Farley says, Good morning, Ray. Fantastic history. Well, we're delighted to bring you the history because, as I said, we're here with Mullingar's historian, Ruth Illingworth. Just want to show you, the, these <coughs> are advertisements which actually appeared in the local newspaper. We'll bring around there, yeah. Uh, for the Mullingar Union, I said the Poor Law Union. So you can see there their ad advertisement, the Board of Guardians tenders armchairs for use in the workhouse. Which one is that? The bottom one, the, is that's it? That's the top, the top one there, one, yeah. 1896, I think. I think. Wow. Uh, 40 armchairs for use in the workhouse hospitals. Uh, and then the, the rendering of the dining hall and infirm ward. Uh, 
the the language that was used incidentally was could be quite blunt i mean in the 1840s and 50s they referred to the idiots ward <laughs> which is unfortunate but uh, that was the way Absolutely. pump makers i think so is it the uh, and uh, so these these would have been uh, the poor law union the poor law guardians that they were elected um and actually it was the first public body to which women could be elected although i don't think there were any women on mullingar mm. poor law union but they could be elected to it uh and they they were responsible for running the uh the the union uh the it was paid for by rates levied on all property owners living within the union and 12 miles radius in the workhouse was cons- that was the maximum distance in which a man could be expected to walk from say his house to the workhouse to get help wow. uh, so each each union was sort of had a 12 mile radius from from the workhouse building well that is absolutely superb route we're going to head back again and uh, as I say, you can see all these buildings in the background. There's a lot of history here. Yeah, they, were, they were all built, they all seem to have been built to a kind of standard design. Um, yeah, and, and, cut stone. Uh, but we're, we're one of the relatively few places in Ireland in which the workhouse building is still virtually intact, apart from that demolished hospital wing, which is right, used uh, in, in Mazine. Uh, it's still, I'd say, about 80 percent of the building is still here yeah uh, and there are not many places where that is the case we we'll get out through that and we'll end up climbing out through a hedge or something here <laughs> anyway no that's too much too much um, but look folks we're going to wrap it up uh this is great history once again from ruth dillingworth and um, ruth you've a load of tours going all over the town every week what's the latest much, or greatest uh, at the well, moment ne- next sunday is it's the birthday of James Joyce. He right. was born on the February, February 2nd in 1882. So to mark that occasion, I'm doing a tour of James Joyce's Mullingar, which will start at 4 o'clock. They usually start at 3, but of a meeting earlier on the afternoon. 4 o'clock from the market house, and it lasts just over an hour. And it'll look at the places mentioned in Joyce's writings, like the Greville Arms Hotel, uh, Fagan's office supplies where he put Millie Bloom working as a photographer's assistant uh, in Ulysses and a number of other places. I mean, Joyce came to Mullingar for a few weeks across two summers at the start of the 20th century and he never forgot the town. Fantastic. So if anyone wants to just turn up or do you want to co- contact you? Yeah, no, you, you, can, or... you can just, uh, you can, <coughs> my phone number is 087-947-2583 but you can just turn up. Uh, it's five euro for adults, uh, children are free. There you are, folks. This is Ruth Dillingworth, a piece of history of Mullingar. If you want to know anything, ask Ruth. Good luck. Thanks, Ruth. Thanks very much. Eh?